Open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. So let me ask you, what do you hunger for? Well, pastor, probably half of you are saying, it's close enough to lunchtime. I'm just hungry. I'm hungry for some food. And physical hunger definitely symbolizes all sorts of appetites. People hunger for success. People hunger for popularity, purpose, peace, pleasure, change in the world. I mean, all sorts of things. And the thing is, is that Jesus is the answer for this hunger. And yet the tragedy is that people won't come to him. And this is what we find in John 6. This is what we find today. People hunger. Jesus, the bread of life, is available, and yet they won't come to him. So let's pick back up with the story. The crowd that Jesus had miraculously fed just the night before, well, they had followed him back across the sea to the city of Capernaum. And they're hungry again. This is the next day. But instead of feeding them more bread, Jesus fed them what we would just call words of life. Well, they refused that. They asked Jesus, well, what must we do to go to heaven? And Jesus replied to that question, well, it should be read, reread, and memorized by every single human being. It's in verse 29 where Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. I just want to tell you right there, let me just stop for a moment and remind you, you can't do anything to get right with God. You can't do anything to stay right with God. You must simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who already did everything for you. So let's read now the crowd's response to that. Let's begin in verse 30. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So we live a long, long ways away from these people, the way they thought, the way they lived their lives. And so we really need to take a giant step backwards into the historical setting. Well, this is a crowd of Jewish people. They had been taught by their rabbis for a long time that when the Messiah came, he would duplicate the miracle of giving manna which had originally been given through Moses. In fact, one of their famous writings said this, what did the first redeemer do? That's referring to Moses who rescued or redeemed them out of slavery in Egypt. He brought down the manna. The last redeemer, and referring there to God's promised Messiah, well he will also bring down manna. And so Here's Jesus claiming to be the Messiah. I mean, the crowd could see that. That was clear to them. He's claiming to be the Messiah. And so they naturally expected him to duplicate Moses' miracle. I mean, sure, Jesus fed them the night before. That's quite a miracle. But let's face it. Moses fed the people six times a week for how many years, Bible scholars? Forty years. I mean, come on now. If Jesus is really the Messiah, they're saying, you better start doing what Moses did, right? They are trying to manipulate Jesus into doing what they wanted. Jesus said, you must believe. And they said, we won't believe unless you give us another miracle. Right? Keep on doing it. That's what they're saying right here. So you read that and you realize, well, that's just classic words of unbelief. That's unbelief. And and let's just face it. The way we are naturally, in our natural-born, unsaved state, We always refuse to trust in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We we refuse to trust in his death on the cross and in his resurrection from the grave. The Lord says believe and we always say give us a sign. That's what we do. So Jesus ignored their suggestion and really went straight to the real issue. And he said two things about Moses. We, We read them but he said this. First of all, Moses didn't give that manna. Moses didn't do that. Who gave the manna? 
God did, right? God gave the man. That wasn't Moses' miracle. That was God's miracle. And then secondly, Jesus said, the manna was not the true bread from heaven. That was just earthly bread. You guys just ate it. It just kind of fell from the sky. That's all that was. And then, and then here's the point. Jesus pointed to himself as the true bread. The only bread that can satisfy the real hunger of our human souls. Verse 35, when he says, I am the bread of life. And if you've read John's gospel before, you know that that is one of seven of the famous I am statements that Jesus makes here. And that it teaches, all seven teach tremendous truths about who Jesus is. But, but what does this statement teach us about Jesus and frankly about us? Bread is his topic, so we really just need to consider, we just need to talk about bread this morning. Figure out what does Jesus mean here, so what is important about bread? Well, the first answer is that bread is necessary for life. It's necessary for life. So I, I mentioned that we are vastly separated from the people of that day, and a major point of separation would just be food. We have food everywhere. And they didn't. In fact, you woke up this morning, you could have walked to your refrigerator, you could have walked to your pantry, my goodness, both of which probably have quite a bit of food. But even if you didn't, in, on your way to church, man, you passed by grocery stores, convenience stores, fast food restaurants, donut shops, amen, on your way right here, all of which sell an endless variety of food. We, here's my point, we have never truly hungered or thirsted for anything. So we just need to get that straight. So we cannot feel the hunger of these poor Galilean people that Jesus is talking to. Bread for them was literally necessary for life. Bread was the only staple in their diet. That was it. That was the only thing they could hope to get. And literally, without bread, these people would starve and begin to die. And so now, maybe... We can begin to see why Jesus claimed to be the bread that men and women cannot do without. And I just have to stop and just ask you, are, are you trying to do without Jesus? Is that what you're trying to do in your life? Are you literally living your life without Jesus? Are you the one who says, you know, look, Pastor, I, it's not that I don't believe, but I can take care of myself. I don't need religion in my life. I've got things figured out, right? I, I mean, I can get by. I, I live in this very affluent age in the United States of America. I have a house. I have a car. I've got plenty to eat. I've got a good job. I've got a wife. I've got a family. I don't need this Jesus you're talking about. Quit, you know, that, that might work for you, but quit pushing your thoughts and your needs off on me, Pastor Todd. I don't need all that. Well, let me just ask you if you somewhat would identify with that mindset. Let's just say that everything goes wonderfully well for you for the rest of of your life. I mean never any setbacks, no fall down, no throwing yourself into the ditch, no getting kicked to the ditch, you know, just it goes what great for you. What happens if that happens? But you lose your soul. Oh just how about that? I mean would you consider that a great gain? Man, life went great. Oh, but I lost my eternal soul. Would you consider that a wonderful win? Is that a great bargain to do without Jesus forever? I just simply say, don't play fast and loose with your eternal soul. Because just as Jesus is necessary for life, or rather just as bread is necessary for life, I'm telling you Jesus is necessary for eternal life. Eternal life. Secondly, what's important about, about bread? Well, bread is suited for everyone. It's suited for everyone. Now, I know not everybody likes everything. Uh, not, ever, not everybody can even eat everything. Do you remember the nursery rhyme? Jack Spratt could eat no fat, his wife could eat no lean. That's right, you know. Some people never eat sweets, other people are vegetarians and they never eat meats. Uh, but have you noticed, it's funny, bread really is kind of suited for everyone. Have you noticed? Uh, maybe you're cooking Italian tonight. Well, there's a bread for that. Have you noticed that? Or do you have a roast in the oven at home right now? I mean, the, the potatoes and the carrots and all that. Wow, there's a bread for that too. Could I interest in anybody, anyone in going to hideaway pizza tonight? I like hideaway pizza. Wow, there's a bread for that too. And what do they call that? Garlic knots. I don't, I'm thinking they're going to serve garlic knots in heaven. I mean all that olive oil and butter dripping all over. I mean, that's just a little Holy Spirit goodness right there on a plate. Or maybe, you know, it's going to get cold, I heard later this week. Maybe you're planning on making a hot soup for a cold day. There's a bread for that too. Bread is suitable for everyone, Every 
culture of the world with all of the varieties of cuisine. It's interesting. They all love bread. They all make bread. Well, in the same way, the Lord Jesus Christ is perfectly suited to the needs of everyone. Sometimes people tell me, you know, again, Pastor, I, I get it. You know, for you and the kind of people you hang out with, I, I know, you know, that you talk about Jesus and all that, and, and he's all right for you, but again, he's not for me. And that is not uncommon at all in these days that we live in. And I've noticed that if a person kind of fancies themselves as I, I'm above average intelligence, well, then all of a sudden they begin to think that Jesus Christ is only for the ignorant people. You know, the people beneath them. Oh, they, they need a crutch. They need something to believe in. They can't really take control of their own life. And I've noticed that. Or if a person is just more average, right? Just kind of a C average kind of a person. Well, then they tend to think that Christ might be, well, he's just for those rich people, that those smart people got it all figured out. Or somebody might imagine themselves to be very sophisticated, very enlightened. And they think that Jesus is only just for the commoners. And just on and on. The point is, though, is that Jesus is for everyone, just as everyone likes bread. And I tell you, Jesus is for you. He, he is for you. He's the Savior of the world, and that, that includes the peasants as well as the kings and queens who are on the, uh, on the throne. And so just as every class of people eats bread, Jesus is able to satisfy every class of sinners. That is you and me. That is rich sinners, poor sinners, cultured sinners, illiterate sinners, people from everywhere. Third, what is it about bread? Well, bread is a daily food. It's a daily food. And this one brings us into a whole new area, and it is the area of the Christian life. Everything that I have said before has to do with trusting Jesus initially for your salvation. But when you trust Christ as your Savior, well, that is hardly the end. Actually, that is the beginning, the wonderful beginning that brings you into a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will grow by feeding on Jesus every single day. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. In that prayer, Jesus places incredible emphasis on the words this day and daily. All throughout that prayer. And the idea, his idea is that we should ask for a repeated nourishment, a repeated filling of it. In fact, when scholars first began to translate out of the Greek New Testament into English years ago, and the very first time that we could actually read an English Bible, I say we, these are our predecessors, they didn't really know exactly what that word translated out of the Greek could be. What, what exactly did it mean? Because it's not used very much in the Bible, that word daily. Well, they finally ran across some helps. Such that, for instance, they discovered a piece of papyrus, just a little piece of ancient writing, and this they discovered it, discovered it in, in Egypt, and it helped them to understand this Greek term and what it meant and what it meant. So that little piece of paper basically was an accounting form. And it, it listed out the daily rations for a group of people who were going to go do something. And it basically said, so you're going to need X number of this product, and you're going to need X number of that product, and X number of that each day for your encounter, each day for your mission. They were going to go out and do something. Well, then they discovered a, a very similar list, but this one's way off in Pompeii, another part of the ancient empire there. And, and this piece of paper also itemized a day's supply of provisions for a group of people. And so they begin to learn, okay, both of these terms, both of these pieces of paper, as well as other ancient documents, they begin to realize, okay, this, this word that, that Jesus used in the New Testament, he's just simply talking about items that are rationed out daily. Every day you're like, well, duh. You know? But again, we live in the year 2022 now, right? Imagine being the first one to put the Bible into English. There, it's like, okay, this word means something rationed out every day. So, stay with me. If we put these two Bible verses together, Give us this day our daily bread. I am the bread of life. Let's put those two together. I think two truths just emerge. And the first truth is obvious. God cares about our bodies. Just that. He cares about your physical body. God provides for the physical needs of our bodies. And the Lord's prayer speaks of that consistently all the way through it. I've noticed that way too many Christians, they minimize the importance of our bodies. As if that somehow makes them more spiritual. Well, that's not right. That's stupid. Did you know that Christianity is the only religion in the world that takes the physical human body with the full seriousness that God intends? The Bible teaches that God gave us a soul, yes, but what else did he give? 
a body. He gave us a body. The Bible also teaches that God won't just redeem our souls. He will also redeem what? Our bodies. And that is why, did you know this? It's why funerals, burials, cemeteries that have an individualized headstone with people's name and their pertinent information and their dates. Have you noticed that? What? Did you know that Christianity is the only culture of, of the world that got that started? That's straight out of the Bible. You see, we know that God has future plans for our bodies. We know that God will actually raise up our dead bodies to newness of life when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. We know that when Christ returns, this world and this period of history is all said and done, and there is a new heavens and a new earth, as the Bible describes it. We're going to be there if we know the Lord Jesus, and how will we be there? As these dismembered, kind of ghostly, kind of just floating around? No, in physical bodies that will be remade on that day. So if our bodies carry such tremendous importance for the future, well, my goodness, it just makes sense that it's correct and right to pray for the needs that we face with our bodies right now. Are you hungry? Are you sick? Are you disturbed? Are you sad? I mean, just all the things that it means to be a human being in the cloaked shell of this body. That means we, we, God loves to hear your prayers just about food and about homes and about clothes, all the necessities of, necessities of life. And we've got the, the great illustration of this truth that I'm talking about here, right here in John 6, because what did Jesus do? What was the miracle? What did he do over across the sea on the mountainside with that group? What did he do? Fed them. He fed their empty stomachs. You know, Jesus cares, and Je Jesus cares for you. But on the other hand, there's a second truth, and it's that God cares for our spiritual needs. Our spiritual needs. And this one is by far the most important of the, of the two. We have spiritual needs, just as we have physical needs. And, and we see this reality here in America. Poll after poll indicates that there is an intense hunger on the part of millions of Americans right now. Intense. People are hungry, and I don't mean just for food. I don't mean just for things. I don't mean just for meaning. They're hungry for spiritual nourishment. Now, they don't know that. And all the while, the Lord Jesus Christ is the bread of life. All the while, only Jesus can satisfy their hunger. And so you think about that. Well, so surely we, we're the church, right? We know about Jesus. So surely we are out there telling, you and me, we're out there telling all of our starving friends, starving neighbors about Jesus, right? Aren't, aren't all of we churches doing that? Oh, my goodness, actually, no. We, and when I say we, I don't mean you necessarily. I just mean we in the church in America. We seem to be more interested right now in building bigger churches. We seem to be more interested in competing with each other for bigger audiences, bigger budgets. Everything's bigger and better in America, including church. And it's like, meanwhile, the, the evangelical church caravan just keeps going around. It's like a dog and pony show. And it's going around and around as if nothing's wrong and nobody's starving out there. I love to read a guy named Michael Horton very insightful theologian, accurately assesses culture through the lens of, of the Bible. Let me just quote for you. It's a fairly lengthy quote, but it's worth it. He wrote the following regarding the American church. We hid our skeletons in the closet and barked at the secular press for finding them. We boycotted whatever we didn't have the sophistication to confront intelligently or creatively. We pride ourselves on being politically powerful, while at the same time, millions leave our entertaining services malnourished each Sunday. Time and Newsweek are calling ours the age of anxiety. Faced with lies, deficits, and institutions out of control, churches would be a good place to look for an anchor. But according to those same surveys, millions of Americans are cynical about the role of the church in terms of answering the really big questions. And many of those who do give the church a try hear the same pop psychology, shallow and worn phrases and meaningless slogans they hear in culture, looking for something different, something serious. In an age of silliness, they often discover a church that has too little time for truth. Numbers, that's the name of the game. Looking for bread, they are often given stone. People all around us face intense hunger. And they don't 
know where to find bread because they're spiritually lost. And, and we just see that intense hunger all around us. We see it today just in the civil and social unrest. You know, people are getting herded into their little special interest groups, such as the Deep on the Cops movement. You know, turn on the news, and you'll hear about the Deep on the Cops, that big movement. You know, That's the problem, you know, those people who got herded into that little tribe. There's the problem. You know, Deep on the corrupt police departments and everything will be perfect. Then we'll be fed. That's what they'd say, but it's interesting if you watch the news right now, and I mean like literally this weekend, even the most progressive leaders in the defund the police movement are now being forced to see that, well, that's not quite the answer that we thought it would be. Crime is spinning out of control in some of our largest cities. Cop shootings in some of our largest cities are, cities are on the rise. People are facing intense hunger, and they don't know where to find bread because they're spiritually lost. You know, the COVID pandemic, we talked about it already this morning. My goodness, that triggered an intense manifestation of people's hunger. I'll give you some examples. Millions left the workforce. Either they were required to or got somebody checks in from the government, half of them lying about it, getting a whole bunch of money. You know, people's bank accounts have swollen. You know, many, many businesses have lied about the number of employees who own the company. But the point is, many, many people are are not working the way they used to and, and we're not meant to be that way and they're discovering now that all of these workers that should be working are now rootless and restless God made us to work it goes on my goodness the children millions of children still you know, maybe not right here in Tulsa but millions of children have been kept from their schools and they're now suffering way worse than just educational deficits several studies reveal that kids have been hit incredibly hard emotionally psychologically, physically, depression is way up among kids, child abuse unbelievably up, malnutrition up. You know, these are the kinds of issues that spark national debate obviously, but our starving godless culture doesn't even know now how to debate civilly with one another. Have you noticed that? Turn on the news, listen to them shout at each other. I mean, at a time when our people are hungering the most, our leaders are at each other's throats the most. People are allowing themselves again to be herded into their special interest groups, their tribes, and they just shout at everybody else. And nobody's looking for common ground. Everyone grabs for whatever little scrap of bread. This reminds me of the, like the dogs in Nicaragua. Some of us have been there. Nicaragua is a third world country where human beings live with hunger at the starvation level. And so I just tell you, a life for a dog in Nicaragua, Nicaragua my goodness, it is, it's horrendous. Well, we refer to these wonderful animals as pets here in the U.S. We treat them like loved members of the family. Some of your dogs, I promise you, most of your dogs eat better than any dog that has ever lived a life in Nicaragua. There, these bone-thin animals, they are just pests who actually compete with humans for food. And I, I have watched one of us Americans because, you know, we bring our own food down there. We eat great down there. And so we eat, and there's always a pack of dogs just on the perimeter. They never get too close because they're used to being knocked in the head by Nicaraguans. And these dogs, bone thin, tail tucked between their legs, you know, we've already eaten enough. And I've watched one of us just throw a scrap of bread on the ground. You talk about a race, and you talk about a fight for that one scrap of bread. And church, really, that is a sad picture of us Americans who are starving spiritually. Just the people that we know and love. You know, we live around people who think a scrap of anything will satisfy them. Oh, the government threw them a scrap. Oh, that, that was thrown there. You know, and they will race for that, fight for that, and they'll attack anyone who has what they don't. I just say it again. People are searching for the bread that satisfies, but they are searching in all the wrong places because only Jesus satisfies. And I wonder, is, could that be your condition? even just a little bit. You may have devoted most of your life, yeah, pastor, I'm saved. Well, that's great, but you still may have devoted most of your life to satisfying your hunger for other things. Material possessions, power, prestige, control, whatever it is, and you've really never looked to God in order to be fed spiritually. Oh, and you pray, you know, God, meet my physical needs, and he's promised to do that, and you'll pray for stuff like that, you know, keep my wife healthy, keep my kids healthy, you know, and you just keep, you, you do all that, but you have never made, made it a habit to pray, God, give me the spiritual bread that comes down from heaven. 
And that brings us to the fourth and final thing about bread this morning. Bread produces growth. We need to grow spiritually. I just tell you, the church of Jesus Christ is very, very weak in our age. And it is weak simply because the people who comprise it are not strong. Where are the great churches of a former age? Churches that were filled with ordinary men and women who knew the great doctrines of the faith. And not just knew it, they were willing to publicly put their reputation on the line to trumpet very loudly to a starving world that Jesus is the bread of life. Where, where are those people? I spoke to a friend recently who, he was on a business trip with several guys from his company, and so it was like the last night of the weekend, they're on the road, all the guys went out partying to some local club, except my friend, because he's a committed Christian. He wasn't going to go do that. And they all went, you know, and did the things that guys do when they're away from wives and girlfriends and all that kind of stuff on the road, you know, and they act like idiots again, and they all get drunk and party and mess around with women. So now it's the next day at work, and one of them comes up to my buddy, and, and kind of whispers, almost like, I mean, very conspir conspiratorially. He's like, I, I know you're a Christian, and I am too. You know, <laughs> it's like, and, and, with a, and, and Mike's like, good, we're Christian. Because these guys are right over here. I, I, don't, I don't want them to know, you know, because he was drunk with them the night before, right? You know, that's just a sad snapshot of life in the American church. On one hand, out there just acting like the world, and then on the other hand, but don't let them know. You know, wouldn't want to put my reputation on the line. And that's what we've got. Where, where are the great Christians of the past? Where are the great churches of the past? We don't have strong churches today. What we have is a very weak, anemic Christianity. We've got a whole lot of easy believism coupled with some morality. Be a good person. And so why? What, what's the reason for this sickly, malnourished Christianity? It's simply this. People, I mean church people, refuse to feed upon the Lord Jesus Christ who can make them grow. Just that. Now let me just ask you, is your Bible dusty? Uh, don't answer. Think about where your Bible, child, where did I put that? See, let's see, okay, that was like right back about Christmas last time I set that down. When we put the Christmas tree up, so now, okay, so now, is your Bible dusty? One of Joseph's professors recently told their class that a dusty Bible is one of the great, greatest dangers to your life. Pretty clever. If your Bible is dusty, I'll just tell you, you're starving. If your Bible is dusty and you are starving, you will seek satisfaction in all the wrong places. If your Bible is dusty and you are starving and you are searching in all the wrong places, you will mess your life up. You just will. That's what starving, hungry people do. Go home today and dust off your Bible and ask the Lord to help you feed daily on the priceless bread that your soul is craving, is craving right now. I mean, wouldn't you like to see growth, growth in our church? Wouldn't you like to see growth in your life? Then you've got to feed on Jesus, who is the bread of life. And that means, first of all, do not look to men as the source of your nourishment. That's what the crowd was doing. They were looking to the teaching of their rabbis. They were looking to Moses. They were saying, we are Jews. We're people of tradition. You know, I, you know we're the people. We've had it all handed down to us through Moses, through history. Don't look to the past. Don't look to men or women as your source of teaching. Now yes, human beings can be good channels of good teaching. I try my best to be that, right? But I'll tell you there is no power in the name Todd. <laughs> this sounds goofy to say, doesn't it? There's no power. Pastor Todd, you know, but nothing in any man or woman. There is however power in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the name at whom when he returns every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that, that he is the Lord. He's the Lord. In the second place, don't look to earthly things for your satisfaction. Again, that is what the people of Christ's day were doing. I just ask, are you looking only for your earthly needs to be granted? God will satisfy those. He promised to take care of you. But if that's the whole part of your desire, you are never, never going to see a great move of the Holy Spirit in your life. You just won't. You won't. You just starve. Let me close by coming full circle just to bread. 
bread. Have you ever thought about everything that grain must go through before it becomes bread? We are so far removed, by the way, from where stuff comes from. You know, we, you mean a chicken isn't already slight? You mean it doesn't come like on, on styrofoam, breast already, to be, you know? You know, it's, it's amazing. There's actually still barnyards and farms and, you know, plants. But have you ever thought about what grain must go through before it becomes bread? Well, first of all, it's got to be planted, and then it's got to grow. And then when it's ripe, someone's going to come through and cut it down. They're going to winnow it, that old-fashioned farming term. They're going to beat, beat it, you know, and you know, get all the grain to separate from the chaff. And then it's going to be ground into flour. Well, then finally, all that has to be subject, subjected to the fiery heat of the oven. And who doesn't like fresh baked bread? I can taste it now. Buttery garlic knots. There's your word for the day. <laughs> now I'm really getting it going. You know, bread. It is only by that process that it's able to become bread which sustains life. And brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, that was the experience of the Lord Jesus in order that he might become your bread. Think about it. He he was born. He was planted in this world. And he grew. And then he was cut down by sinful evil men. Beaten. He was bruised for your iniquities and mine. And then finally he passed through the fiery heat of God's holy wrath as he took your place and mine in judgment. And all of that was to his glory. That's why he came. He did it for you. He wanted to do it. He longed to do it. He suffered all of that so that you, or so that he could become the bread of life for you. And so how, after all of that, can you refuse to feed upon him? Go home and draw from his fullness daily. Go home, dust off your Bible, and grow strong. And come back together, all of us, and worship together. Would you please stand to your feet as we pray? And Father, we just conclude our service this time of commitment, this time as we reflect on what you have said through this passage of Scripture that you gave. And we pray, God, now, just for anyone who needs to come to Christ initially for salvation, and we pray also, though, all for the rest of us, those of us who have brought strong pangs of hunger, and we've been seeking to get those, those pangs and that hungering filled in all the wrong places, God, Lead us to repent, and may we just feed upon the bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.